Great. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this session of the AONA Masterclass Series brought to you by all the members of the AO North America Hand Educational Committee. Uh, there's been a slight change in plans uh, for tonight. We were originally supposed to have Dr. Ben Hammer talk to us about hand flaps, but due to unforeseen circumstances, uh, he won't be able to present tonight. Thankfully for us, Dr. Amit Gupta, an old friend of mine and a supremely talented surgeon, agreed to step into the breach and uh, take over the responsibilities for tonight. Amit is one of those rare individuals who is not only supremely talented in orthopedic procedures, but is a wonderful uh, plastic surgeon as well, even though he's not a trained plastic surgeon. He is probably one of the most leading exponents of the PIA flap that I have ever come across, and he does a beautiful job. So um, he's going to be talking to us about soft tissue coverage in the upper extremity. And uh, Nick Poulos is going to be moderating the session along with Jeff Lawton. So with that being said, I'm going to hand it off to Nick. Nick, all yours. Chai, thank you. Uh, you know, I think leaders around the world should be envious of how you have navigated AO North America hand through COVID. You haven't tried to force an in-person curriculum into the Zoom format, but have actually devised new innovative courses that are only possible through Zoom. And I think this master class series is really no exception. So thank you for your leadership there. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's master, Dr. Amit Gupta, who, as you just heard, is pinch hitting tonight, making it all the more impressive. Of course, he is a professor at the University of Louisville, the author of scores of peer-reviewed publications and chapters, but he's actually the course director of my first in-person AO trauma hand course. And what you realize when you hear him speak is that he's not just an amazing surgeon passionate about hand surgery, but he's actually passionate about the hand in general and all its glory and function. And if you haven't picked up a copy of The Grasping Hand, shameless plug, I highly uh, recommend it. Uh, the photos are amazing. So what better person to lead us tonight through soft tissue coverage of the hand? Uh, this is me, Nick Polis, and Dr. Lawton, who will be answering all of your burning questions, which we encourage you to put in the chat and we will try and uh, address in a timely fashion, and certainly ones that uh, are important we will bring up at the end and discuss uh, with the other panelists here. These are the disclosures for uh, tonight's speakers. Here's our agenda. Um, at the end, if we have time, we may go over a case, but uh, we wanna give Dr. Gupta the time he needs and then certainly answer all of the questions uh, from all of you out there watching tonight. There is the opportunity for CME credit. Uh, a link to the evaluation of the course will be given out at the end of the session, uh, which will allow you to claim credit and access your certificate. This is our content uh, validation statement. And then again, just Zoom etiquette, all of the microphones have been muted uh, and video cameras turned off. So we encourage you though, to send your questions in through the Q&A box and uh, Dr. Lawton will um, review and sort the questions uh, and address them in the chat box. And without further ado, I will stop sharing my screen and allow you, Dr. Gupta, to take over. Thank you, Nick. Thanks for the introduction. Um, thank you, Chai. Sorry to uh, come in. Uh, like a pinch hitter, but uh, I'll try and do my best. So um, <clears throat> let's go and do the screen share. Okay. All right. So um, <clears throat> my topic today is soft tissue coverage in the upper extremity. Uh, I'll go through the historical uh, and a little bit personal perspective of how uh, I went through this journey of uh, soft tissue coverage uh, because, as you heard, I'm an orthopedic uh, surgeon by training. So I had great teachers, and one of the uh, my great teacher was the Professor Kleinert, and he um, <clears throat> taught me a lot of things in hand surgery as well as soft tissue coverage. I was uh, fortunate enough to have Professor Ackland as my teacher in anatomy and plastic surgery and microsurgery. 
but my greatest teacher was Professor Louis Shecker, who taught me soft tissue handling and uh, <clears throat> flaps. My earlier teacher was, was uh, Dr. Burke, Frank Burke in uh, Derby, England, and uh, Dr. Uli Buchler in uh, uh, Switzerland, and of course in Louisville, a great microsurgery teacher, uh, Professor Sai. You also learn from your colleagues and the great uh, colleagues that I had, uh, David Elliott uh, in England, um, Steve uh, Morris from Canada, my partner, Steve McCabe, and my fellow and colleague and friend, Michael Sincere. These are great plastic surgeons and I learned a lot from them and picked up whatever I could from these people. So, you know, generally wars are terrible, especially the First World War is a terrible situation. But wars also, um, when people came in, they had uh, lots of injuries to the hands and to the face because they had shrapnel injuries. Um, and these shrapnels would go in and make deep cavities in the face, uh, take out bones and soft tissues and cause a lot of burns and contractures in the hand. And Dr. Gillis uh, in England, who was a, a New Zealander, uh, he um, was uh, faced with uh, treating these war injuries and he had to cover them. So he devised ways of uh, taking these pedicle flaps uh, and he would tube them and then transport them to the hand, to the chest, to the face, to resurface uh, areas. And in doing that, uh, once he took them, and this is from the uh, Royal College Museum of Wax, and this is a model from the Army Museum, um, computer generated model. So um, he would take these uh, flaps uh, and pedicle them and take it to their site. So these would bring in new tissue and this new tissue would help in uh, controlling the infection, also fill the voids uh, and prevent further infection. So this was a great help in doing that, but um, what a great innovative way of uh, taking tissue from one place to the other. Of course, this was not new. This was done in 600 BC uh, by Shushruta, who took uh, tissue uh, from the forehead down to the nose. But in the massive scale in the World War, this was uh, Harold Gillies who uh, did all that, taking this tube pedicle um, uh, tissues. Um, and when people started doing this uh, flaps, which were not tubed, but um, taken from uh, the abdomen, from the chest wall, from the abdominal wall. Uh, and they would say that you have to make a really wide base uh, to provide, uh, to make this flaps uh, really uh, viable. So the concept that you have to make a wide base, because if you make a narrow base, the flaps will not survive, really took hold. It was left to Stuart Milton in 1970 in his famous article in um, British Journal of Surgery that he uh, busted this myth of length width ratio. He injected these uh, pig skins and then he took different flaps and he showed that uh, the level of injection where the injection ink was uh, visible, that's exactly uh, the point where till where the flap survived. And it didn't matter what the width of the base was, the flap just survived just to that level. In dissecting this, he also showed these little tiny vessels. He didn't name them, but we now know the names that these are perforators. And so these are perforators on which these flaps are, are, are surviving or living. And so uh, although he didn't have the name for it, he absolutely uh, had the concept. So uh, it it was then another great, um, uh, you know, paper from uh, Cannesburn Hospital in Glasgow. And Louisville had a great Cannesburn connection because uh, uh, Liz Graham Lister came from Cannesburn and uh, Bob Ackland came from Cannesburn and Louis Shecker came from Cannesburn. So got a great Cannesburn connection with Louisville. So uh, Ian McGregor and Ian Jackson um, wrote this paper in which they showed that although we are doing ground flaps, they didn't actually know the uh, anatomy, but they could show that uh, they now have an anatomical knowledge and they were able to find that uh, this uh, flap was surviving on this superficial epigastric vessel. Uh, and uh, this was, this was uh, key because now you know that there's a named artery and you know exactly how far it is. So people were taking flaps they would take flaps up to here and they would extend the flap beyond that. They would call this axial pattern part and they'll call this the random pattern part. Uh, one of the uh, funny quotations that um, 
uh, Professor Ackland used to tell us was that this is this is uh, the the junction between uh, axial pattern and random pattern is where my um, knowledge ends and my ignorance begins. Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, how people would lift up and make make a tube, and uh, based on the uh, superficial epigastric, superficial circumflex iliac, and superficial epigastric, depending on where you're going to go, superficial circumflex iliac generally. And you can thin the flap. They're very nice flaps, and you could go into the first web, and you could uh, have beautiful results, and even now we use it a lot. In the old days, before microsurgery, people used to reconstruct, use a lot of these tube pedicle flaps based on the uh, groin flap, uh, and then they would come back and take a um, sensate part of the um, middle finger or the ring finger, take a neurovascular bundle and use that as a sensate flap onto the uh, reconstruct the thumb. But of course, we don't need to do that anymore. So the groin flap has a hallowed place in history of plastic and hand surgery. Uh, it was, um, uh, as I'll come to it, um, this was the first free flap, uh, seldom done as a free flap in the hand, but be, uh, it gives a good result. It's a large coverage area. And it's nowhere close to the zone of injury, and it's relatively easy to elevate. So here's the um, branch superficial circumflex iliac artery, uh, and uh, you take it out and uh, go out towards the medial side, and you can pedicle it, uh, or you can uh, attach it directly. And here's the uh, flap taken down. You can close the, you can flex the uh, leg, and you can close the uh, defect. This is pedicled. Um, as you can see, it's pedicled here. Now there are other, uh, as you, if you can um, feel a perforator, there are uh, pedicled para-umbilical perforators based flaps, which are gaining in popularity. And if you can Doppler a flap, you can, you can, uh, uh, you can get a, a pedicle and you can uh, make a tube pedicle skin out of that. So here's the uh, PUP flap uh, that uh, is slightly more proximal in the abdomen and uh, less uncomfortable for the patient. So enter the microsurgeon, and uh, this was in the 60s, 1962, Dr. Ke uh, Kleinert and Dr. Kasdan, they, did, um, they wrote some papers, and uh, Dr. Kleinert was a vascular surgeon, and he started make, uh, repairing smaller and smaller vessels, and he ultimately started repairing very small vessels in the forearm and hand, and he, they wrote this article in JBJS at that time. Uh, in 65, uh, Professor Tsushimu Tamai uh, did the first, first successful replantation in 1965. This was a thumb replant um, uh, that was Tsushimu Tamai. Uh, in 69, by that time, uh, Professor Bunky was working in California, and uh, you know they were doing this total hand transfers, uh, and um, uh, they, they, he had a great uh, setup in, in California and San Francisco. Now, everything was brought together, all these concepts were brought together um, by um, Ronald Daniel and Ian Taylor in Melbourne. Um, and this is Ian Taylor, young Ian Taylor. Um, Ronald Daniel was a fellow with him. They basically um, took the concept of the vascular supply of the groin flap and took a groin flap and put it in the, in the leg. So this was published in, uh, initially in the ANZ, that's uh, Australian New Zealand Journal of Surgery, and subsequently in the PRNS in 73, about distant transfer with microvascular transfer, first free flap. And so they could uh, outline the anatomy, the arterial anatomy, the superficial circumflex iliac artery and vein, the superficial epigastric, depending on where you want to put your flap, and you can take the flap on the vessels and then you can basically transfer them. Then they wrote up a whole bunch of papers on, on different flaps and their anatomical uh, supply. And people started doing different flaps, particularly um, the dorsalis speedis flap gained the great popularity because it was thin skin and you could take it very easily with a big artery, long pedicle, and people started taking these uh, dorsalis speedis flaps. Soon they realized that the donor site was a big problem. Um, and then that pretty much got uh, abandoned. However, it gained popularity for a while. So microsurgery has enabled us to do a lot of things like uh, uh, coverage of this um, uh, non-replantable thumb with a, um, a toe transfer, with a partial toe transfer, uh, like a twisted toe transfer. And here you are, it's a complicated procedure, but it gives you excellent uh, cosmetic as well as functional result uh, for the patient.
We can even do very, very tiny reconstructions um, like a, a pulp replant like this. And this had no, uh, no vein, so we used leach. And then it gives you the best result that you can possibly get. Dr. Taylor, Ian Taylor in Melbourne, also studied the vascularity of the fibula. And then he was able to show uh, the first patient in which he did a free fibula transfer uh, for a big uh, defect in the fibula. But if we can go, we have to go back to Karl Mancho um, in Germany uh, and, um, and then uh, Michel Samon in uh, France. And Karl Mancho, when he was a medical student, he started injecting uh, these muscles in the skin with uh, unknown dye and he uh, dissected them. He didn't have x-rays at that time, he dissected them. Uh, but Michel Samon had the um, x-rays and he x-rayed the uh, vessels and they could find the, uh, the structure uh, of these vessels. Now, these um, um, things were published in German and French and did not reach Gilly, so he didn't know the anatomy of that. Again, Ian Taylor um, um, talked about uh, this angiosomes. They come to the concept of angiosomes, that there are these arterial um, areas which are supplying different parts of the skin and they have their own arteries. And then you have these choke arteries which will open up. And that was the um, that was how uh, the concept of delay of flaps worked. Um, and also that you can have these perforators and you can if you can Doppler perforator, you can uh, make your own flap. So he injected the different parts of the bodies and he could pick up all these arterial patterns and he wrote a beautiful book uh, about it. So uh, all these uh, injections. So in terms of reconstructive ladder, what is it? It's a minimal procedure that will provide a reasonable coverage. It can be started with simple closure, skin graft, local flaps, regional flaps, and then we go on to free flaps. So that's the reconstructive ladder. So let's just look at local flaps and regional flaps just for sake of time. Uh, this is again from work of uh, <clears throat> uh, my friend Steve Morris, who worked with Ian Taylor, uh, and he, they injected um, these uh, skin in the hand, and the, you know, in the hand you have tremendous vascularity, and you can Doppler lots of places, and if you can Doppler a vessel, you can you can do a flap on it. So the first flap is Eric Moberg. This is Eric Moberg, Swedish uh, gentleman. Uh, my claim to fame is when I was a fellow, I, I, I took him to the station, had a good chat with him. Uh, he was a wonderful person. So his flap consisted of um, uh, this device. He had to cover oblique or transverse defects at the tip of the thumb uh, in which you needed good coverage, which is sensate coverage. So basically it took the whole of the volar skin of the thumb along with the, both the neurovascular bundles to the level of the paratenon of the flexors, and then flex the IP joint of the thumb to come and meet that uh, skin. So it's not an advancement flap, really. It's the, uh, the, uh, the uh, cell skeleton is coming to meet the flap, and it gives a beautiful um, coverage, very quick, very easy to do. But you can only do it in the thumb, because in the other fingers, the dorsal um, uh, supply is not that robust. So here's the thing uh, showing the uh, the uh, skin being taken over, and here's the end result of a, a nice uh, pulp coverage. So here's the um, here's a dissection of uh, the Moberg flap that we did uh, a few uh, couple of years ago, I think. Uh, so um, <clears throat> this is the Moberg flap of coverage of transverse amputation of the thumb. And here's the uh, defect that needs to be covered. The Moberg is not an advancement flap. It's a flap of the volar part of the skin of the thumb on both neurovascular bundles. And then the IP joint of the thumb flexes to meet that skin. So it's not an advancement. There is an advancement uh, variation where you can make a more uh, proximal cut and then use that to advance the skin. That becomes a different flap altogether. So in Moberg flap, um, we make two incisions, one on either side in the mid-lateral line. So we'll start with the radial side, go to the mid-lateral line, and then find the plane of the flexor tendon and everything Armor to the flex tendon gets reflected. Let's 
So this is the incision line. There's some dorsal branches of the artery. This will need to be clipped and cut. And then we find the flexor tendon sheet, dorsal vessels. We've on the other side, mid-lateral line incision. Again, find the same plane, superficial to the, or armor to the flexor sheath, which includes, make sure that the flap has both the uh, neurovascular bundles, So I'll show here the flap, which now has has been raised. Now you can only do this in the thumb because uh, in the other digits, the circulation, the dorsal circulation is not that robust. So you should not do that in the other digits, so just in the thumb because there's a very good dorsal circulation. So here's the neurovascular bundle on one side, here on the other side. So now the IP joint of the thumb flexes to meet the uh, flap, which does not advance, the IP joint flexes to meet it. And you need to keep, your, keep the IP joint flex for about two weeks. Now, what I do is I put chromic cap gut switches here to switch it to the nail bed. Um, and this is how it is. And this gives a beautiful sensate flap with good contour of the of the thumb uh, excellent sensation and very quick reconstruction of the thumb slightly shorter but overall uh, very good reconstruction this is the moberg flap so this is the clinical example transverse um, cut uh, and here's the moberg being raised as we've seen and the ip joint flexing to meet and here you see uh, nice uh, ultimate results. There are modifications. They're cupped. Uh, you can cup it up uh, to get a better contour if there's a, a transverse cut. Um, you can do a um, uh, O'Brien, which is a um, incis incision. Uh, Houston, which is another incision, which will advance it. Uh, extended Dellen. There is a um, um, you know other other modifications of this. So here's the modification in which you do an advancement of the of the flap, more like an O'Brien uh, modification. And this is the Houston modification um, of the incision. Next flap is the uh, first dorsal metacarpal artery of the kite flap. It's been popularized mostly by, uh, in, uh, by Guy Fouché from uh, uh, Strasbourg in France. Um, it's a quick flap and it's easy to do. Um, and um, that's why you you do it. Uh, it's in the fascia overlying the muscles of the first dorsal and process muscle and comes off the radial artery, it comes off from the uh, first web space of the radial artery and lies on the fascia. So you want to take the whole fascia and don't want to uh, skeletonize it. So here's the anatomical uh, 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 appearance of this. And you see here, um, it's the there's the diagram which shows the, the skeleton. It should not skeletonize it. Take the whole fascia with it. Uh, you can take it from the, just at the level, you take a cross finger flap uh, and take the artery along with a, a whole strip of like a kite uh, of a fascia. So here are the uh, metacarpal vessels um, and um, uh, and so, so this is an example of the first dorsal metacarpal artery. and metacarpal artery flap covering the thumb tip and here this the uh, donor side is skin grafted the split skin graft or a full thickness skin graft and here's a burn in the uh, dorsum of the thumb which has been treated with their first dorsal metacarpal artery flap this kid had a burn injury uh, and involved the eponychial fold the eponychial fold reconstructions are challenging because you don't want the eponychial fold to stick to the nail 
otherwise the nail will not grow. So in this case, we took a first dorsal metacarpal artery flap, but then we took out a strip of the flap and then we turned the skin in uh, outside in towards the um, nail so that the nail bed would not stick to the uh, to the flap. So this is how the nail um, fold was reconstructed, the eponychial fold was reconstructed along with the dorsal uh, skin defect. And here it is um, um, reconstructed like that. Metacarpal artery flap, there are lots of metacarpal arteries and the uh, radial ones are more reliable than the ulnar ones. And these are deep to the tendons. Uh, so these tendons, uh, these metacarpal arteries are deep to the tendons and you have to dissect uh, deep to the tendons to get these metacarpal arteries. And you can take long pedicles and, and transport them elsewhere. Um, now, you don't need to do that. There was a nice flap described by Afquaba from uh, Edinburgh. And here's Afquaba. Uh, Afquaba described this, um, this uh, flap uh, in the British Journal of Plastic Surgery in which he could Doppler a vessel just distal to the juncture at tendinum, and you could then turn this around. It's a branch of the metacarpal artery. I told you the metacarpal arteries are deep, and there's a branch of the metacarpal artery just distal to the juncture at tendinum. You can Doppler this, and then you can turn it around 180 degrees, and you can take a very long flap. And here's the anatomical dissection showing that. And here's uh, some articles, uh, some pictures from Afkwaba's article in British Journal of Plastic Surgery. So um, the, we did some injected injection studies and you could see there's lots of perforators, but the, there's a main perforator just distal, as I mentioned, to the juncture tendinum, um, just proximal to the MCP joint. Uh, and here it is, you can see that perforator, but there are lots of other perforators also, which are supplying. So it's a very robust flap. Um, and here is, a, um, here is our dissection. So this is the quavo flap. The quavo flap is based on a branch from the metacarpal artery. It's a dorsal branch which comes off the metacarpal artery distal to the juncturary tendinum and supplies the skin on the back of the hand. The radial sided flaps are more reliable than the ulnar sided flaps. So the second metacarpal branch third metacarpal branch would be more reliable than the fourth metacarpal branch. So here we're going to do a quavo flap in which a, we'll take a dorsal skin and we can rotate this dorsal skin based on this pedicle um, 180 degrees to cover the dorsal of the digit all the way up to the PIP joint. I've even taken it all the way up to the uh, middle phalanx and DIP joint. And you can extend this more proximally. Now, the skin on the back of the hand is very lax, and most of these defects can be closed primarily. So the donor defect is not uh, very big and can be closed primarily. It's not a big problem. Uh, the advantage of the quavo flap, it's very quick, very easy, it's reliable, uh, and it's uh, uh, convenient to cover dorsal hand defects. So this is the... Um, section, it's at the level of the paratenon of the extensor. Um, pr prior to commencement of the quavo flap, uh, it would be nice to do a Doppler study. And once you Doppler the vessels, you know exactly where your vessels are. And they're usually just distal to the uh, juncture tendon. Uh, so we're going to do the quavo flap now. So I made it uh, skin paddle, and I'm going to elevate the skin paddle uh, at the level of the paratenon of the extensor. So, elevating the skin paddle here, um, just at the just like a, a cross finger flap, really, that level. Um, and now we can see the vessel here. You can see the perforator coming across like this. And it's coming just just to the juncture tendinum, okay? So we don't want to skeletonize that vessel because the vena comitantes are going to be with the vessel. Um, 
and you can divide the distal veins, uh, there'll be a nice big, always there's a nice big distal vein, uh, superficial vein at that level. Um, it's tempting to include that, um, but it's uh, it'll not rotate. So I think it's good to divide that distal vein um, and uh, rely on the uh, vena comitantes and the artery, which are always uh, reliable. So here's the here's the pedicle. Multiple vessels here, as you can see. And this this pedicle, this uh, this uh, branch, will actually communicate, or it comes off the metacarpal artery. But we don't need to dissect that. Uh, this this uh, can now be rotated to cover the back of the finger, and it's very good for covering defects in the back of the digit all the way to the PIP joint. Um, you can cover the web space. Uh, if you extend it more proximally, you can cover the middle phalanx also. So excellent flap, uh, very quick, very easy, and very reliable. Okay, do the so here's, a, here's a, some examples of the quava flap. This is a coverage of the dorsal um, defect in the finger. Um, here's the pedicle branch. And uh, this is another extended coverage with a long pedicle going proximally, covering all the way up to the DIP joint. And you can, you can do that. Um, this patient had a uh, fracture along with a defect. So once you fix the fracture, repair the tendon, then you did a quavo flap to cover that. Uh, and this goes on to uh, nice coverage. This patient had a gunshot wound, low velocity gunshot wound after um, a bone grafting and fixation. Uh, you need to do a flap, which will allow you to start early active range of motion and quava flap just uh, does that very well. The next we come to regional flaps, the reverse radial forearm flap. It's a cons constant independent vascularity suitable for coverage of dorsal hand defects. You can have a large flap you can do early mobilization and you can take vascularized bone graft. And nowadays you can also just take um, a superficial to the fascia, superficial dissection of the radial forearm flap. It's a little difficult, but uh, you can do it. So here's a uh, superficial dissection of the radial forearm flap, taking the radial, uh, radial artery along with it. Uh, and you, you have to be careful of the branch, uh, the dorsal sensory branch of the radial nerve, protect that. And then you can do a superficial harvest to minimize the donor defect. And uh, here is a, um, uh, this is a Michael Sincere's case, and this is taking over and uh, covering the, uh, the thumb. Again, another coverage of the thumb. Um, <clears throat> my favorite flap is the posterior intrusus artery flap, which is a branch of the ulnar artery, uh, intrusus trunk. It runs in the septum in the fifth and the sixth compartment, EDM and ECU. It gives seven to 14 cutaneous branches and communicates with the anterior and process artery on the distal end. And also it has a dorsal uh, carpal artery branch and a branch of the ulnar head. And 5% uh, ulibuclear set had no distal anastomosis, but you can rely on the dorsal carpal artery branch for this flap to survive. So if you inject these, uh, you'll get a good um, supply on the dorsum, whole of the dorsal skin of the forearm. And here's it between fifth and the sixth compartment. Here's the, uh, here's the posterior interosseous artery giving perforators and anastomosing with the anterior interosseous artery. Um, and uh, these are perforators uh, coming off the posterior interosseous artery, uh, fasciocutaneous flap. And here's a uh, dissection of anatomical dissection. So this shows the as we open Fifth this, and sixth this compartment. I go distally this, first. Uh, these muscle branches will have to be cauterized and, and separated out. First is nerve. Yeah, time for picture. So, so, so this, it, it comes into contact with the posterior process nerve. Yeah. So, two, one, start. Okay. And then continue to uh, divide the septum so that uh, we are keeping the. Um, Artery along with the flap and dividing all the muscle breath. Now we there's a branch going to the ulnar head. AIN and the P, AIA and the PIA. So 
So here it is. There's some branches going to the muscle here with cauterize these. And this branch. At this point, you can divide this fascia. So you can go in between and you can divide this fascia so that it becomes easier to, to move the pedicle. So you can divide that fascia, making sure that the communication to the AIA is in view and intact. Recording two one. Um, so now you can see the communication from the posterior interosseous artery to the anterior interosseous artery. So this here is the anterior interosseous artery, uh, which I will bring up. It's anterior interosseous artery. So communication. It's a nice communication. So at this point, um, zoom out a little bit. We can. We have a good pedicle, and we can get it. So now this is a, here's a clinical example: gunshot wound, um, the fracture is treated with uh, 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 Aliakras graft, and the defect covered immediately with uh, posterior interosseous artery flap. This goes on to heal, and it's already uh, you know uh, it, everything heals up pretty good. So combined injuries with an excellent result from immediate flap coverage. This patient had the previous um, uh, treatment with uh, KOR fixation of this complex fracture. And everything got stuck down. So um, it was interfering with his other digits. So everything was taken down, bone graft, span plating, and a uh, posterior interosseous artery flap coverage was done. And early active range of motion results in excellent um, result. This is a, a squamous cell carcinoma excised uh, by the tumor surgeon. And we're left with this defect covered with the posterior interosseous artery flap, good cosmetic coverage. And after reconstruction of the extensive tendons of the thumb, uh, patient got an excellent result. This girl has a little uh, sad story. She was playing uh, in her bedroom, 10-year-old girl playing in her bedroom. Uh, and then she was shot in the, uh, in the hand by a stray bullet from outside. And um, came like this, shattered uh, first metacarpal, um, all the muscles of the thinner eminence gone, big, deep, big skin defect. So after we cleaned everything up, we put a span plate, grafted this, grafted the nerves, um, and uh, did a posterior interosseous artery flap. And this goes on to heal, gives a, a very nice cosmetic result. And she's very, very functional, almost normal now. Um, and we, we did it um, to a hypothenar transfer. So there's a, a burn defect on the volar aspect. You can do a free flap on this, but it'll take a long time. So here we took a posterior interosseous artery flap and we punched it through the interosseous membrane and we brought it over and uh, it gives a nice coverage and uh, quick healing. Go on to end. Now you can use this in many other ways. You can use that for coverage of the elbow. And we just published a uh, series on the posterior interosseous artery flap coverage for the complex elbow wounds. So there's a complex elbow wound, and we can take a posterior interosseous artery flap, but you have to put it, uh, put the pedicle, uh, put the skin paddle more distally. You are bringing it uh, opposite direction, anti-grade. It's an anti-grade flap. So we cover the uh, uh, elbow like this or like this. And here's a guy who had uh, 10 commandments written on his back of his uh, forearm. So I said I would take... Uh, Please, can I take two commandments? And I transferred two commandments, uh, especially the adultery and the false um, um, against false uh, neighbor. Um, so, you, so in terms of uh, flap coverage, you have to restore function. Don't just close wounds in trauma, particularly. And appearance, we have to pay uh, heed to the recipient appearance and donor side appearance. So we come to the reconstructive ladder. What is the reconstructive elevator? Aim for the best possible functional and aesthetic reconstruction for both the recipient and the donor site. Don't be afraid of failure. Fear of failure may lead to compromised result. So goals of reconstruction in this case, restore like with like, restore the sensibility, restore cosmesis, restore mobility, and restore the donor site. Uh, donor site has to be good. So that's why I like something like a groin flap as a free flap transfer, because it's like a 
very beautiful donor site and also uh the flap becomes uh you know it's a, it's a free it's a really a free flap and the store function obviously so think about what all you need to transfer along with the skin transfer so we need we, sometimes we need to surface volume defects we want to make the contour normal we want to cover the exposed fractures and internal fixation device. And we want to provide non-adherent cover for structures which uh, require mobility like the tendons. So we have to think of what we're going to transfer, uh, skin transfer along with bone transfer. We can do toe transfer, composite transfer. We can have a joint transfer. We can use a muscle transfer uh, along with the vascularized tendon or vascularized nerves. So here's a patient who had a gunshot wound, came to us with uh, through and through gunshot wound of the forearm, had an external fixator put in an outside facility and a big defect in his radius uh, and big through and through defect, uh, but the nerves are intact. Uh, so what we did for this, for him was uh, we took a, um, a free fibula with a, with a uh, big skin paddle um, and uh, we took the peroneal artery and then we did a flow through peroneal artery free flap to the radial artery. So we reconstruct the radial artery, the radius, as well as the skin defect, all in one go. And uh, this, is, uh, this is his reconstruction and did very well. Here's a patient who had a thumb injury, crushed thumb uh, with an open wound. And this is Louis Shecker's case. Uh, and basically what he was planning to do is a, is a saw type injury. So the dorsal part has been uh, sheared off. So he took a, 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 he needed a skin paddle and how to reconstruct this. So it took a bone with the lateral arm flap. So with the, with the skin paddle and a uh, beautiful one-step reconstruction results in good, strong thumb with fusion of this. So this brings us to lateral arm flap. This is the workhorse, was the workhorse at Louisville. So this is a beautiful flap it's in the same, same arm. You can do it under the same tourniquet. It's an easy, fast, uh, quick uh, raise of this uh, flap. So you can um, come between the uh, edge of the deltoid and lateral epicondyle, and you can extend it uh, a little bit distally, also extend the flap. It's a fascia cutaneous flap, so you have to find the uh, artery going from the posterior side, and then take the fascia along with it, and you'll find the uh, vessel right on the ridge. Um, then you can go proximally, and you'll, you'll get, a, uh, get about four to five centimeters. And then if you want more, you can, uh, you can do an extended exposure uh, but be careful that the uh, radial nerve is very closely opposed to this uh, pedicle. And as you can see, the, the uh, posterior uh, lower lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm goes to it. So you can become a sensate flap if you wanted to. Um, so the radial nerve is very close to that, but the other, um, and so you have to take the artery along with it, a posterior radial collateral artery. And this is the pedicle going up. Uh, you can go further up. And you can then dissect the lateral head of the uh, triceps and pass it under the lateral head of the triceps, and you can get an extended pedicle and get a really, really long pedicle uh, uh, with this uh, with this uh, approach. So you can get about 12 centimeters, 14 centimeters of, uh, of pedicle length. That should be plenty enough for any trauma reconstruction. You can use just as a fascia, fascial flap or a fascial cutaneous flap, or you can take skin with it. And here's uh, Louis Shecker's case of a reconstruction of the first web space. Um, and um, <clears throat> so you can do uh, once microsurgery, you know, microsurgery, you can do all sorts of different flaps. And uh, this is a flap that uh, I was faced with a uh, skin uh, skin defect in the volar forearm after um, an injury. And here we decided to do a posterior intrasis artery flap as a thin flap, um, uh, as a free flap. So we send the the digits and then uh, later uh, separate them out, uh, and this worked pretty well for, for this patient. Uh, if you have a dorsal defect, uh, if you want to do a very good cosmetic result, uh, nothing better than a groin flap, a free groin flap. Uh, here's a free groin flap uh, after reconstruction of the tendons. Um, for the volar aspect of the hand, uh, when you have defects like this, I prefer to use thin muscles. I prefer to use the serratus, and serratus works very well for this part uh, because you can then put a skin graft over it uh, and uh, it, it, it will flatten out and work very nicely in terms of cosmesis and also uh, for function. So choice of free flaps, if you have a large defect, you choose an anterolateral thigh flap. 
If you have to fill a volume, you need a large muscle like erectus or moderate defect, the latissimus dorsi, a gracilis I use for animations or for volume defect coverage. Um, so for moderate defects, I use uh, groin fascia cutaneous flap. And again, for moderate soft tissue defects, we'll use the lateral arm flap. And for free fibula, or we can use it with or without the skin. So here's a patient who had um, uh, uh, a tumor taken out from the back of the elbow. This is after the uh, tumor surgeon has finished with it. Big defect in the back of the elbow. So we take a latissimus flap. And we just took, because as a kid, we took just a half the latissimus. Uh, you don't want to take the whole latissimus. You don't even need it. So it took half the latissimus, and uh, you can cover that. And it, uh, that covers very well. Nice uh, filling of the defect, as well as nice cushioning of the back of the elbow. This patient had a uh, complex uh, elbow problem uh, after burns, uh, and we needed to cover this with a with a. Uh, with some sort of a filler. So we use the gracilis, a free gracilis, um, a big pedicle, long pedicle, a lot of muscle, and covered that up very nicely. Good result. Uh, rectus, I try not to use the rectus except if you need a large muscle. And here again, big elbow defect. Uh, we could take a rectus, but it's in the same uh, side. You don't have to turn the patient around like a latissimus. You can use it large vessels. You can pretty much do it under uh, with the loops uh, and free rectus flap. This patient uh, had a um, rollover injury, she is, um, and we wanted to do something which did not have a big uh, donor defect. So here, after debridement, as you can see, big defect here. She took a large groin flap, a free flap, twenty-seven by fifteen, and we gave her a. Um, you know, nice scar um, and donor defect was minimal. This patient came from three hospitals from another state and had uh, crush burn roller type injury uh, and had 360 degree circular defect, but all the nerves were intact and he had good functioning tendons. So the, the challenge was how to cover this. So we decided to take, this is my First year in practice, and my senior partner says, oh, boy, I have a case for you. So this is a big challenge. So this is the amount of uh, uh, stuff that I have to cover. So I decided to take um, the uh, parascapular flap as well as the this whole of the latissimus in one pedicle. And you can do that. You can take, the, um, you can take it in one pedicle, and we use that to cover both sides of the, of the forearm. And he got fair. He got very good results with that. Here's a case uh, of a 35-year-old mechanic who had his forearm caught in a conveyor belt, sustained a severe degloving injury to the vola forearm, both bones fractures, extensive contamination, and loss of flexor musculature. Both bones were broken. Radial head was dislocated with injury to annular ligament median, and the ulnar nerves were intact. His ulnar artery was transected. So the proximal muscles, FCR was gone, FPL was completely gone, FDS was completely gone, and FTP was completely gone. So here's the, here's the injury uh, after debridement, uh, after fixation. This is the radial head you can see on the elbow, uh, radius ulna, uh, and uh, this is the defect. So extensive irrigation debridement, ORIF of the radius and the ulna, reduction of the radial head, ulnar artery repaired with the vein graft, um, good peripheral circulation. So wounds healed, range of motion, minimal wrist flexion, digital extensor intact, but no flexion of the digits. So we took a free gracilis flap to the FTP. So gracilis artery to the, uh, uh, the obturator artery to the ulnar artery, vena comitantes, anastomosis, the obturator nerve to the branch, the anterior and trosseous nerve, and, um, and then we uh, did that as a um, muscle transfer, um, functioning muscle transfer. And you've, you've, we've seen the excellent um, lecture by Dr. Stevanovich on gracilis transfer. So I'll not go into that just to show you the uh, gracilis with the skin paddle that we took with the pedicle and the nerve. Uh, and uh, then eventually we uh, sequentially excised the skin paddle. And uh, here is the excellent result in an adult. Uh, it's rare to get results like this in an adult, uh, and that's probably why I'm showing you anyway. So this is the result that the patient had, and this is, and, and he went back to his original work. 
after the systems of injury. Make another fist. And open it back up and hold it. And then make a fist. Hold it. Release. Good. Fist. So I just want to uh, talk about this thing that we've been doing in Louisville for a long time, immediate free flap coverage. So within 24 hours of injury, uh, was first reported in 1980, uh, it violates the time-honored principle of lower extremity management and war wound doctrine. But there are advantages. Benefits from early coverage, uh, other coverage could be suboptimal, the patient should be stable, the wound can be radically debrided. That's very important. And you should have the facility and the personnel to do it. So think of replantation. It's a contaminated part, devascularized, got an open fracture, the tendons are divided, the nerves are divided. What do you do? We debride, we do an osteosynthesis, we repair the tendons, revascularize, we do a neurography. And here's an um, amputation of the forearm, uh, which I had uh, many years ago. This patient came to me, it's a young 16 year old. Um, had a complete amputation, and this is the end result uh, after at four years. And as you can see, all his thena musculature as well as intrinsics, everything is back, and he's on absolutely normal hand. So basically, replantation is an emergency composite free flap, which is badly harvested and has long ischemia time. So why can't we do the same for a good flap? So what what why do we don't do that? Because we fear flap loss, we fear infection, we fear loss of function. Um, so let's look at this. We, the advantages of early surgery is the soft tissue planes are much better. There's less vasospasm in micro reconstruction as well as perivascular tissue inflammation or scarring or edema. And one step reconstruction of complex injuries is possible. So some people say, oh, well, stage transfer is safer, bacterial contamination is unknown at that time, and it requires aggressive debridement. You know, you may not even need a flap. You can put this uh, uh, tissue, uh, uh, tissue substitutes, and timing can be inconvenient. That is true. So arguments for immediate free flap is anatomy is unscarred, vessels are normal except for trauma, and the, the, the structures are not desiccated, and you can get a tension-free closure. What does the literature say? Marco Godina, uh, who visited Louisville many times in, uh, in the 80s, wrote up this paper. If he has less, if uh, flap was less than uh, 72 hours, 72 hours to three months or more than three months. So he showed that the flap failure was, uh, uh, was very low in the early group. Uh, and, uh, you know, 72 to three uh, months was the highest flap failure infection rate. And after three months, it, uh, it normalized a little bit. But the hospital number of days the patients spend in the hospital was much less when you did the flap early. And there have been other papers uh, from Louisville, Lister and Shecker, and then the other papers elsewhere from Chen and from Ninkovich, from Austria. We looked at our uh, series of uh, 282 cases from Louisville. And we published this in um, Journal of um, uh, Plastic and Reconstructive uh, and Aesthetic Surgery in British Journal. So we had a large number of lateral arm flaps. These were done immediately or th thereafter. Uh, so we had fair fair amount of, uh, you know, we didn't have much of a flap loss. We didn't have very many infections. Uh, and the only thing that was uh, negatively impacting was if you had to do an astomotic revision or interpositional vein graft. That means if you had some technical problems with the flap, then the flap would give you trouble. Otherwise, everything uh, would be okay. So, um, so indications of uh, early surgery are soft tissue planes are easier, less vasospasm, and one-step reconstruction of complex injuries. So emergency free flaps can be done with good results and low morbidity. But you have to debride very well. Patient factors, wound factors, and surgeon and hospital logistics are very important to take care of. So here is a patient who had a uh, wound, saw injury to the back of the uh, wrist and hand. All the tendons were cut. And here we are taking an inventory of all the tendons, um, showing which ones we need to repair. So we take tendon graft from the toes, uh, and we do an immediate free flap. And as a, uh, he gets excellent result from this. 
uh, open fracture with an open wound in the forearm covered with a uh, parascapular flap. And here it is, got excellent result from that. This is Louis Shecker's case, uh, open fractures. Uh, he, he, he taught me how to do this. So you can put the tendons through the fat uh, and that will make the tendons glide well. It's a fasciocutaneous flap, but you can put the tendons through the fat. Um, and I have uh, since done that and you get excellent result with that. And here's, here's my case where we have put the tendons through the fat and here's the, it, this, here's how you do it. You just pass your tendon, pass it through the, through the fat of the flap and you, you cover it up. If you have a fracture, don't worry about it. You can graft it. You can excise the uh, um, jagged bones and you can graft these with the cordial graft and you can plate it. And then as long as you cover it with good vascularized tissue, I think uh, things will be fine. You can start early active range of motion and you get excellent results in these complex cases. Dorsal degloving injuries, you can have a large defect. You can use an anterolateral thigh flap, fascia cutaneous, uh, reconstruct the tendons along with it. And here you go. This patient is a gunshot wound. He has a, um, <clears throat> a, a far local fire chief who, who, whose thing was to teach about uh, safety and he was uh, out hunting and he had his hand on the gun and his dog ran and he, his gun went off. He was very embarrassed to come and have this gunshot wound, but it completely blown off his thumb. It was devascularized, big defect in the uh, bone as well as in the uh, soft tissues. So after debridement, uh, we took an inventory and here's he metacarpal head is broken into two and big defect in the uh, metacarpal. So bone grafting of this area, took an uh, cordiocancellus bone graft, uh, tried to reconstruct the MP joint, uh, bring the two condyles together, span plating and span grafting, uh, and uh, a free flap immediately uh, after revascularization of the thumb. So we have vein grafts in the thumb, so we have to revascularize it or cover it. You can't put Integra on it, so cover that with a, with a free flap, and uh, this is his, uh, his result. This patient had a uh, injury uh, with a limb shredder. He, she put her uh, hand in a limb shredder and came with this. Normally I would amputate, but she had completely sensate fingers and she begged me just to keep it, um, uh, keep the hand. Uh, so what the thumb was gone, his thumb was completely gone. So after debridement, uh, external fixator there and we took a free fibula with the skin paddle uh, and um, and uh, reconstructed that, and you can see that the uh, free fibula split into two, uh, split uh, with going one going to the side of the um, small finger, and uh, then we um, holocyzed. And uh, despite uh, uh, my best uh, ad own advice, I holocyzed the index finger, and uh, she got a fairly good uh, hand, which is sensate and it's much better. I I can present to you, it's much better than any prosthetic hand that you can give her. So we came from there to there. Uh, you can have composite things. You can have, uh, this is a fire um, uh, fireworks injury. The firecracker went off in his hand um, and this kid. So after debridement, we put a posterior process artery flap to cover this and then did a toe transfer to the thumb. And here you can see he's got excellent result. He just graduated from high school and he went into, he is going to college to study explosives and figure that. Um, when you have complex injuries like this, anterolateral thigh flap works very well, but adequate debridement is essential. This is six months. Uh, this again is Michael Sincere's patient uh, case, um, big long pedicle, and uh, you can have a um, big, uh, big flap. Now here's a case I want to, come back to what we started off with, which was the two pedicle of Achilles. So this patient came, he had a fused elbow uh, and all his skin graft, which is a, this, this uh, hand was crushed and devascularized and it had been uh, revascularized somehow many years ago. And he wanted the skin graft was breaking down, an unstable scar, uh, and he didn't have much uh, in the way of movement in his fingers. So we wanted to uh, take the skin graft off and cover his uh, uh, large defect on the elbow as well as on the forearm. So after excision, so he only has an intraosseous artery 
Uh, he does not have radial or ulnar arteries, just surviving on one artery. Uh, so we were uh, somewhat limited in what we could do. So we took a large anterolateral thigh flap um, uh, with this, and uh, we this is the donor defect, and we put that on the uh, forearm and anterior aspect of his elbow. And then we came back with an old flap, a Gillies pedicle flap, um, with a free uh, with a uh, Gillies pedicle groin flap, and we use that to cover his elbow posteriorly, so he gets an elbow coverage. And this guy is now a very big businessman, and he's doing very well. He's got excellent uh, uh, coverage. He's happy with his uh, forearm, and he's got good function of his hand. And finally, this patient uh, is a surgeon who came with a snow blower injury. So I have to caution you with all the snow and ice going on. Be careful with your machines. This, the surgeon urologist came with a snowblower injury, and he had such bad amputations that it could not be replanted, segmental amputations and, and um, avulsed uh, digits. So uh, I used uh, different techniques, different local flaps to keep the length of the digits, um, and um, he ultimately modified his instruments and actually went back to work, and I had to give him a certificate that he could actually uh, do his surgery. So it's not the hand, it's the mind. The mind makes the hand, the hand makes the mind. And this case only proves that. Um, so I will stop here and thank you very much uh, for listening to me. Amit, that was uh, wonderful as always. Thank you. Thank you for that. Some amazing cases. There were a couple questions that, that came yeah. up that uh, we have some time for. Um, one going back to the Moberg flap. And when you flex the IP joint, you, you, we, by definition, get a flexion contracture. What do you see clinically in those patients um, after that? How much of it sort of works out over time versus how much are they left with? And do you see that as a functional deficit? If you keep, if you keep it flexed for two weeks and start movement after two weeks, it's not a problem. Okay. It's only when you keep it on, keep the uh, IP joint flexed or pin the IP joint for four, six, eight weeks, that's when it becomes from. And you don't need to do that. It only needs two weeks for this, uh, you know, the skin to heal to the top. You just have to have a little healing, start at two weeks, start at, uh, early gentle active motion and then uh, passive motion. And I tell you, I have not seen big problems if you just do it for two weeks. So okay. early motion, um, but graduate, graduated early motion. All right. And then another question um, with some of the flaps, like the PIA flap for coverage of the dorsal hand. If you have to go back and do something in terms of bone grafting or in terms of hardware removal, at what point are you confident in the flap to make an incision through it versus elevating the whole flap to get down to the metacarpals? Right. You can elevate half the flap because it, you know, the, it would have taken um, circulation from the other parts. So you can elevate half the flap uh, and, uh, you know, you don't have to worry about the pedicle so much because it's already, it's taken uh, circulation from the other parts. So you can elevate. I usually uh, tell people to elevate half the flap, not the whole flap. If you have to elevate the whole flap, elevate from distal to proximal so that you at least have your pedicle. Um, and then, uh, what is your thoughts or do you have a role for the ulnar artery perforator flap? That's one that's being talked about now. And I just wanted to get your thoughts right, on, on where right, you right. think that might fit. Yeah. I, I, I did not put any cases there. I, I like the ulnar artery perforator flap very much. The Becker flap, the Becker Gilbert flap. So that's a good flap. You have to, you have to find the perforator, which, which is slightly proximal to the ulnar head. Uh, arising from the ulnar artery, you can Doppler it, and you can take a really large flap. Some of my Chinese friends have taken huge flaps all the way up to the elbow, and I dare not take that that big a flap with that. But it, apparently, the small little perforator makes these flaps survive quite quite well. So it's a nice, robust flap, as uh, and uh, as long as you've got the anatomy right, the ulnar uh, forearm flap works really well. It's a true propeller flap. Yeah. And then speaking of propeller flaps, you, you've made this point at an AO course in person, but when you're talking about the quaba flaps, 
you always make the point that it's more predictable radially and less predictable as you go ownerly. Correct. Does that mean you you don't take it from the ring small web space? No, I, I do take it, but I just worry a little bit more <laughs> that kind. But I do take it as long as you can perfor as long as you can Doppler it. It's not a problem. If you can Doppler a vessel, it'll be there and it will survive. All right, excellent. Nick, if you want to present your case, maybe to the professor. Yes, I will um, bring this up here. While we're doing that, um, and I bring this up, I just wanted to ask you too. You know, as a as a master of all of these flaps, where do the crutches for those of us that aren't masters, like Integra and Woundvax, fit into your ladder? When are you using those um, other tools? Well, um, I generally don't use Integra except if, if supposing some flapper to fail. And if, if the flap fails and I have no bailout, um, then I'll use Integra as a temporary coverage. Um, but generally I prefer flaps. I'm, I'm from the old school. I prefer flaps rather than uh, Integra. So um, I just go with flaps, but I would do it only if I get a failure. Very good. This is a chip shot for you. So this is a uh, partial thumb amputation uh, that I saw a 50 year old uh, healthy male gentleman who uh, works sort of in a factory and lost the tip of his thumb in a brake press accident. Uh, he's not not a smoker, uh, non English speaking in Rochester, which uh, is tougher in Minnesota than some other places. And this is um, his initial presentation here. And then I'm going to show you he was wearing a glove. So fortunately, he also had uh, this piece here sharp and transected. So I guess first question for you is, is this something that uh, in Louisville that you would uh, consider even replanting? Sure. Yeah, I, I've replanted smaller than this, but yeah, we, could, we would uh, we would do it. Um, you know, uh, there's, as long as there's an artery, you're yeah, fine. Uh, if you can find a small artery, um, Look under the microscope in the um, in a side room. Uh, look at the vessels. Uh, reflect the skin up. Uh, find an artery. There probably isn't a vein, um, but you may be able to find a volo vein. But find one, at least one artery, and then you can replant it. But I think you know you got you have some nail, right? I mean, you don't have a nail there, so this would be a good one to if he if he's worried about cosmesis would good good one to talk about uh, replantation or you can shorten it or you can just do a, um, a local flap uh, like a first dorsal medical lottery flap or something like that sure yep so i i talked to him about replantation what that would mean for him and he was uh, not interested yeah. people would not be yeah, generally <laughs> Uh, these are his x-rays and you can see it's really mostly a volar, uh, you know, he lost his nail, but not too much bone here. And you did mention the point about, uh, I think maybe it came up in the question too, with the Moberg, that the bone yeah. is often short as well yes. uh, in these, in these patients. So now I think I've shown you his x-rays and his uh, soft tissue. You mentioned the FDMA. Mm -hmm. um, what's the limit of the Moberg? Flat. You can do the you, you can you can do the Moberg here. It's only that it's going to give you the nice thing about the Moberg is it's going to give you sensate coverage to the pulp. Uh, it'll be um, you know uh, you can do the Moberg. Uh, it'll be a little short thumb. You won't have a nail. You'll have to really take out the uh, germinal matrix. Um, otherwise, you'll get small little nail bits coming up later on, and then um, use the Moberg to cover it up. You may have to do a little skin graft on the top. The, the other thing that you might consider is to shorten it a little bit more and cover it up. Uh, you can get a, you can get, you, you can take a flap from the volar part of the pulp and just deflect it up. Um, and then that will cover it and then put a full thickness skin graft or split skin graft on top of it. So that works pretty well. It's like a, um, it's like an envelope of, of the soft tissue, which is attached to the volar pulp. You can cover that. It's not been written up. Um, but you know, you can, you can use that or you can use a, um, uh, flap from the side of the uh, index finger. Great. So here are his, uh, pictures now, uh, in so he's got a, he's got a nail, he's got a nail, um, um, you know, he's got a general matrix, so he will get a little bit of a nail. So 
I would go with the Moberg on this one. Great. Now I uh, and in Louisville, you would do this the uh, you would do this the next day or that day. You would do this acutely. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I was still young in practice, so I wanted to rinse it out, take a look, and then go yeah. read up in a book a little bit to figure out what I was going to do. <laughs> so here he is after his initial debridement, and I did do uh, an FDMA uh, for him, um, which uh, which worked well. Here he was at a month later. Uh, That's reasonable. Excellent result, yeah. And then uh, we have him here at uh, six months. You can see he's lost the tip of his index finger uh, in the past as well, so he's a frequent flyer to the right. hand surgery trauma, uh, departments. Yep. And, uh, I think the cosmesis of this flap is actually pretty good. He's got a little bit of hair there, uh, on mm -hmm. the end. And, uh, this was about uh, a year or so afterwards, yep. um, he's on, back to work doing well. The other flap I wanted to ask you about that's kind of gained some popularity. What about the Venus flaps that uh, we hear about, especially out of California and their role in uh, acute hand trauma coverage? I like Venus flaps. I like Venus flaps for when I'm doing replants and I'm doing some, I've, I'm, I've got a shortage of tissue. Uh, I particularly like Venus flaps when I'm working on, say, um, a uh, ring, ring avulsions. So in ring avulsions, you have this situation where we've, we've done an uh, um, artery repair, but you have this beaten up tissue on the back of the finger and you do a venous repair and the whole thing dies because you put a skin graft in. First, the skin graft will stick to the uh, vein graft or vein repair, and this will compromise your arterial repair secondarily. So what I do is I would do a venous flap on the back. So you, you get a coverage, you get a vein, um, you know, vein to vein um, uh, transfer, and you get a nice coverage. And you can do a vein, uh, venous flap or you can do a cross finger flap. So you can do a cross finger flap and bring it over, just a reverse cross finger flap and keep the vein. So you can astomose the veins proximally and distally. So you get a vein now, uh, which has got a vein graft from the other finger and you've got a little uh, skin over the uh, extensor tendon. So that works well. But venous flaps work well when you want to take the vein and have an arterial defect and you have a defect on the volar side. So you take it, I take it from the uh, volar aspect of the distal forearm, take a little small little piece, there are lots of nice veins here and you uh, make sure you switch it around and uh, the ends. And so you can get an arterial reconstruction. So you get AVA uh, reconstruction. So it'll be a flow through uh, venous flap and it'll cover your uh, skin also. Hey, Amit and Nicholas. You have no idea how happy you made me by mentioning venous flaps. Some of the earliest data on venous flaps came from my alma mater back in Bombay right. in the early 1990s from Ravin Tate and Mukun Tate. Mm -hmm. Ravin did a little lot. Mm -hmm. I, I have, you have no idea how proud I am to see this being mentioned. So thank you. My pleasure. Uh, Dr. Rhea, I know you're on the line. It looks like you were answering uh, a question, or maybe Dr. Lawton's answering a question about secondary healing. And, uh, you know, it always makes me nervous when the trainees tell me they're just going to ronger back, back the bone. Cause, um, you know, they haven't seen what the possibilities of hand surgery are. And I'm not sure, uh, that I always feel comfortable with the PGY2 just rongering back for secondary coverage. Any comments on that? Uh, that's your last resort, I think, but, uh, yeah, I think you're right. Um, so if you, if you have to cover it and you, you need to, you need to properly debride. Uh, and if you have to range the bone, you have to do it, but you have to get a good debridement. That's the key for any reconstruction. So you have to get a very good debridement, almost like a tumor uh, debridement. Any of these complex reconstructions or immediate reconstructions that I talked about, you cannot do them unless you have a good debridement. And once you have a good debridement, sharp debridement, all the way um, beyond the zone of injury, then you can cover that defect with a with a nice flap. Anything else from any of the panelists that we have on? Nope. Just talk about the the uh, hematoma, tegaderm uh, dressing, and things like that. I think uh, we've hit it all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amit. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. That was uh, excellent. So let me uh, share my screen here again. 
just to wrap things up here. So uh, amazing session so far with uh, Dr. McKinnon, Dr. Stavanovich, and now Dr. Gupta. We do have four more uh, sessions here left in the master class series. The next will be on the 17th uh, with Dr. Lalonde talking about wide awake surgery. Uh, one of the great things for those of you who are registered is the ability to access these and go back. And the videos we saw today with the cadaveric dissections, I had no doubt we would see some great videos and pictures of cadaveric um, dissections from Dr. Gupta are available on the AOHAN North America uh, YouTube uh, channel. So look forward to those or go back to those as needed. And then lastly, this master's class uh, series podcast is available. Uh, we have the website down here and it is streaming where you prefer to get your podcast from. Uh, and this is a uh, great car listening for sure. You don't have to wear your mask like that microphone in your own car if you would not like to. So that concludes our uh, master class tonight on soft tissue coverage. Thank you, Dr. Lawton. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Uh, very impressive pinch hitting tonight. Um, Max, I need to say a couple of words. Um, it is not easy to put together a talk of this nature at less than 36 hours notice. For Amit to do this is not only a phenomenal uh, undertaking, but it's basically a labor of love. And we are really fortunate and immensely grateful to have him as part of AONA faculty. So Amit, you have my personal gratitude and gratitude from AONA. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, man. Thank you, guys. See you later. Recording stopped. Uh, it's not a course without Dr. Ree and his child in the video. That's mm -hmm. <laughs> Little Ree. How are you doing, Peter? Are you better? <laughs> yes, thank you. And Jay, you how are you? Much. Is Jay still here? Yeah, uh, Jay's gone. Hey, Jay's but, here? No, Jay's not here. Yeah, Peter, Peter are you doing okay? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, good, good, good. I'm All glad. Right. Thanks, Mac. Um, thank you. Amit, good to see you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Mag, Amit. Thanks. Thank you. See you.